Um, our next panel, as I mentioned before, is focused on uh, something that's getting a lot of attention right now, and that is psychedelics and how they are aiding in the transformation of mental health. So please, again, welcome to the stage uh, re retired Brigadier General Lori Sutton. Good afternoon. Was that an inspiring message or what? I mean, Clayton, Karen, Nick, and Amelia, yes, the world will know. Let's give them another big old round of applause. <laughs> the answer is yes, we can scale good. You know, my favorite quote from Maya Angelou is she said, we did what we knew to do. And when we know better, we do better. So that's what it's all about, isn't it now, Rick Doblin? Yes. <laughs> you know, my, my role today with a bunch of panelists like this is just to stay out of the way. So I'm gonna get started, Rick Doblin, my battle buddy to the right, he's gonna tell you a little bit about the mischiefs he's been up to for the last 35 plus years. Then yes. Isaac Gilmore, working with Treat California, Navy SEAL, battle buddy, and of course we've got to round up Brett Waters who is leading the charge, reason for hope, and the veterans charge on Capitol Hill to bring breakthrough therapies to treat PTSD, including psychedelics. So let's get started with you, Rick. Come on. <laughs> Tell us how you're earning your oxygen these days. <laughs> That's a nice thought, how I earn Give us some oxygen. inspiration. <laughs> yes. Well, I'll just say in reference to what we just saw, oh. that we just had a training of therapists in Sarajevo. And we had Ukrainian therapists that had to get permission from the military to leave. Some, the females could come, but the males had to get permission. Mm. We had um, trainees from Bosnia, Serbia, Armenia, Poland, even a woman from uh, Lebanon. And it felt like a mini UN, where these were people from mm. all these different countries that have been fighting and killing each other, but the healers were united in their mission. Mm. So what I've been doing I'll go back 51 years to 1972 when I um, had done a fair amount of LSD and went to a guidance counselor at college and told me that um, there was all this work on LSD research, but it was being shut down. And so for me, it was this idea of how do we feel our common connections? And psychedelics can help people move beyond their understanding of who they are and broaden it. It's not just what kind of tribe you're from, what kind of country, what's your religion, what's your gender, what's your race, there's something that we all share in common. And if people can feel that and know that, then we'll act differently. So that was the, really the impetus for me. It was 1982 when I first tried MDMA. And I realized that I woke up to LSD and the potential of psychedelics after the backlash to the 60s. But I was learning about MDMA as a therapy drug, but it was also being sold as ecstasy as a party drug. So I knew that the backlash was gonna come, but I was ahead of the game for the backlash. And so I started a nonprofit organization to try to protect the therapeutic use of MDMA once the inevitable DEA moved to criminalize it. This was during Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan and Just Say No. And so that happened in 84. And we did um, have terrific experts and we won the DEA administrative law judge hearing. They said MDMA should stay as a medicine in schedule three, but it should be criminalized the recreational use. Mm -hmm. But the DEA ignored that recommendation. We sued and won a couple times in the appeals courts. Eventually the DEA lawyers learned how to satisfy the appeals court. So that meant that there was only one other avenue to bring this back, which was through the FDA. So the 1986 now, um, 37 and a half years ago is when I started MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, as a nonprofit pharma company to try to work through the FDA. And if you saw the New York Times on Saturday, the front page of the national section was about our second successful phase three study. So it's taken us an enormous amount of time, you know, 37, we're, at, we're a very um, old startup <laughs> <laughs> for our 37 and a half years, but we are now. Um, have, have breakthrough therapy status from the FDA. We're deep into the Veterans Administration. We've yet to do work inside the Department of Defense, but we're hoping that's gonna come fairly soon. But the results are, are rather remarkable. They justify the FDA making this into a breakthrough therapy. Um, we had over about 86% of the people in our recent study were responders. 
71% of them no longer had a um, diagnosis of PTSD. Another 15% on top of that had clinically significant reductions of PTSD symptoms. So what we're really trying to do is to globalize access to psychedelic assisted therapy. And so even though we focus just on MDMA, there's ketamine, there's psilocybin, there's ibogaine, there's ayahuasca, there's all different substances. And really the vision that we have in the future is this idea of therapists cross-trained in all the different modalities. And so I'd say for 37 and a half years, our, our animating vision is to make MDMA into a medicine. And now we hope that that'll happen sometime around June of next year. So the new vision that we're trying is a world of net zero trauma by 2070. And what that means is not no trauma, but just there's trauma and then there's multi-generational trauma. And we know about Rachel Yehuda, a researcher here at the Bronx VA that has identified markers in, she studied Holocaust uh, survivors and their children. And so there are markers that pass set points for anxiety, depression, things like that. And so net zero trauma means that we're not adding to the burden either of new trauma or multi-generational trauma. So that means working with refugee camps as we just saw, working with prisoners, working all over the world where there, there's some estimates by 2050 that there could be a billion climate refugees. Mm. So that's why 2070. I think there's a good chance the stresses will be building up over the next generations, but we are now the leading edge of psychedelic assisted therapy. There's other companies coming along. And so I think we have been able to change attitudes. And Rick and, Doblin, if we didn't have you, we <laughs> have had to invent you amazing <laughs> well, record let me, of let service. Let me just say though, that you gave me so much inspiration. It was like 2010 when you contacted us, bef the first person from inside the military. And I just, first off, I was shocked that you reached out. And then I was shocked even further that you were so receptive. It was just inspirational to us to keep going. Suffering is suffering. And my message then continues to be my message now. We ought not be afraid to follow the data and ease the suffering. Yes, the world yes. will know, Rick Doblin. Maybe this is a good time <laughs> to move on to uh, Isaac Gilmore. Isaac, tell us about yourself and the work that you've been doing specifically in California. Thank you. And actually, before I get into that, I really want to thank uh, Matt Swift and the whole Concordia team. You know, they took a gamble on bringing psychedelics here last year, and we really wanted you, but you're already booked. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't have been able to do this without their willingness to take a gamble, the microdose team uh, making introductions for us to the space, and the work you've done for the last 37 years. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can talk about our work without really understanding the labor of love that Rick has put in. Amazing. You know, 37 years and $130 million to get MDDA to this point. And the largest issue that we see in the psychedelic space is there isn't enough money for large scale research and clinical trials. Everything's been benevolence and there's been a huge amount of support, but it's just not enough. And so at Treat California, um, due to the vision of our CEO, Dr. Gina Vontana, she was part of a team that used a kind of obscure legislative structure to create a state agency to pursue research in um, a specific uh, modality at the time, which was stem cells for ALS. And as she looked at the psychedelic space, she saw that we could use that same model to create ultimately our goal as a $5 billion state agency that will pursue large scale clinical trials, um, access care and research. And it's done as a citizen driven ballot initiative, meaning that it's innately bipartisan because it comes from the people. There's no politician behind it, steering it. It's a huge lift. Um, in about a week, we start gathering signatures and we have to gather 1.4 million signatures in six months to be a proposition to be on the ballot next year. But once this is created, it will be the largest funding source the psychedelic and mental health community has ever seen. And all studies will be done in conjunction with the NIH, the FDA, the DEA. So this data will shift the federal perspective and we can allocate funds outside of California. So a best in class uh, research institution like um, Imperial College of London, we can partner with them, put money in their, into their studies, have our trainers go there, train the trainer and come back to California. So this has the ability to impact the entire ecosystem, not just California. And then there's 25 other states that have the legislative structure to follow suit. So that's a kind of treat in a nutshell. Thanks so much. Uh, how, how does someone find out more about Treat California, Isaac? The easiest way is uh, treatcalifornia.org. Okay. Or find me and I'll give you my phone because my, <laughs> my screensaver is a QR code. Okay. No, it's very exciting. It's my home state and I'm thrilled to be working with Dr. Fontana, you, Isaac, and the entire team. This is really cutting edge work that, uh, that matters, really, really matters. 
Speaking of work that matters, Brett Waters, tell us about the work that you've been doing, both with Reason for Hope as well as the uh, veteran-led mental health coalition. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so my name is Brett Waters. I'm an attorney. I, I spent uh, five years doing antitrust litigation at a big law firm in New York City that I left at the end of last year to focus on uh, policy and advocacy for uh, psychedelic therapy for mental health care and, and suicide prevention uh, as a full-time job because the need is so great uh, to really, as kind of this panel discusses, uh, shift the paradigm of mental health care and, and suicide prevention. And uh, my uh, you know, reason for hope, the, the organization I first started is named in memory of my mother who I lost to suicide five years ago during my first year of practice, her name was Sherry Hope Waters. And I'd lost my grandfather, her father, to suicide when I was young. So uh, as I you know, was doing general mental health and suicide prevention work and came across the research in the space and was just astounded by how backwards the current, you know, education policy, all of the barriers getting in the way of patients being able to access this potentially life-saving treatment. And, you know, this isn't just, you know, my own personal you know, view of, of what the research shows of, of these therapies where, you know, we try to take a science-based approach. And, and as Rick mentioned, the FDA has said that MDMA-assisted therapy is a breakthrough therapy for PTSD. The FDA has also said that there are two different psilocybin therapies that are breakthrough therapies, one for um, the uh, uh, Compass Pathways for Treatment-Resistant Depression, one from the USONA Institute, another nonprofit for major depressive disorder. And this means that the FDA views these as you know, shown as safe through clinical trials and potentially much more effective than current treatments we have. And so the fact that these are subject to the highest barriers to research and are not available even for compassionate use for patients who have tried everything else is unconscionable to me and, and you know, just find it personally offensive. And, and we have been doing everything we can to get funding, not quite at the scale that what Treat California is looking for, uh, but we've gotten, you know, uh, through advocacy across four different states, over $12 million uh, for state funding, both for research and implementation with the training of therapists to be able to provide this form of treatment, particularly through these breakthrough therapies for veteran suicide prevention programs. And we have been working at the federal level on a, a bill called the Breakthrough Therapies Act that would effectively just say, once the FDA has designated something a breakthrough therapy or the FDA has approved it for expanded access, if the active ingredient of those therapies are have a drug controlled under Schedule One, automatically has to be rescheduled to Schedule Two. That reduces the research barriers. It, enables access under the right to try act. And to me, this is just a very basic common sense policy that everyone can get behind. And that's why we're seeing so much bipartisan support. Well, Brett, let me just ask you this. I don't think most people would put veterans in the lead for advocating uh, for psychedelic uh, breakthrough therapies. Either you or Isaac, either one, you wanna address that? Why are veterans taking such a strong leadership role? I think that the evidence of the just personal experiences that a lot of these veterans have had, not just through clinical trials, but really uh, in naturalistic settings, including outside the country. That's how we uh, form the, the Veteran Mental Health Leadership Coalition, which has members like Isaac, uh, who are leaders of different organizations in the space, as well as uh, doctors, researchers, uh, various clinicians and, and providers, including people inside the VA, who are all united in a, basically a public health coalition to help advance this form of treatment to get to as many people as safely and affordably It's another as, way as that possible. veterans can continue to serve. It's Absolutely. another way they can continue to serve. And the stories that they have are just truly just, I mean, so remarkable. And, and it was just through working with some of these veteran organizations, particularly particularly those who are going outside the country to get access to treatment and hearing the life-saving stories that they have and the lengths that they were willing to go to save themselves and their family and their friends. Those stories resonate so strongly because yeah, these are people who have served their country. They should not be forced to go outside the country they serve to get access to potentially life-saving treatment. And I Thank think you. that really yes. is a message that resonates and, and Isaac could certainly speak speak more to it, but like we we just work with so many people who have similar stories. We, we just got 
done with a hearing in Kentucky on Friday. Very conservative state. We've been working closely with the Kentucky Opioid Abatement Advisory Commission. It's considering an allocation of $42 million uh, for Ibogaine research and development mm -hmm. for opioid use disorder. And to hear from so many Navy SEALs who have gone outside the country to get this treatment. Uh, the Dakota Meyer, a Medal of Honor winner, testified. Uh, General Steele, our CEO and president of the Veteran Mental Health Leaders Coalition is a retired three-star general, former chief operating officer of the Marine Corps. I mean, to hear him speak out in support of these people to have the ability to access this treatment inside the country is like really just inspiring. I mean, I'm he came out of retirement to lead this movement. Speaking of former Navy SEALs, I see Isaac uh, <laughs> nodding your head. Isaac, anything you want to add to that? Quite a bit, actually. But um, so General Steele has actually joined Treat as well and has become a, a dear mentor of mine. You know, I have to point out Jesse Gould sitting in the audience with uh, Heroic Hearts, and he'll be moderating on Wednesday. When PTSD and depression hit our community harder, which is in like the 2010s, we didn't sit around. We formed organizations like Jesse's or Vets, uh, Veterans Exploring Treatment Solutions, or No Fallen Heroes, which is uh, a bunch of pilots. And we started solving the problem, but we had to leave our own country to do it. And that wasn't something that was, um, tolerable for us. And so guys started working and General Steele formed the coalition. And it's we've seen the efficacy. It saved our lives. And we are always wanting to be of service. And so we're going to continue to be of service and make sure that what's worked for us is available to other people. Um, so beyond what's going on with the Leadership Coalition, specifically at TREAT, the veteran community is going to make or break this effort. You know, most ballot initiatives are run by a signature gathering firm. So it's kind of sterile and benign. You just have somebody there with a clipboard and you know they might really know what they're talking about, maybe not. We don't want to just be successful in creating TREAT. We want it to truly be a citizen-driven ballot initiative, which means buy-in from our constituents. And in order to do that, I think, and we found that veterans are the best path to it, to take veterans who have either been affected by this themselves, gone through the treatments, and can go and speak to it, or just other veterans that hope that they can because they can't get on off the wait list to go overseas, that they're going out in the communities, they're going to the coffee shop, the, the mall, to the ball game and saying, hey, sign this petition so we can help ourselves and we can help you. And in the process, I think, just to wax a little bit, something our country desperately needs is more connective tissue between our veteran community and our community at large. And our hope is that what we're building in this infrastructure with TREAT to get TREAT through will just kind of continue to propagate thereafter of veterans going and speaking at town halls and VFW posts and the communities coming out to engage with them. So this is ours. No, thank yeah. you so much. And Rick, yes. Oh, I just want to add that um, veterans are people that the general public listens to, but it's really important to say that most of the people in our studies, most of the people that are traumatized are women from sexual abuse, sexual assault, domestic violence, something like that. But they don't get as much pickup in the media or as much support from the public nor would that have gotten us the bipartisan support that we've got by working with veterans. Yes. Well, and to make the point as well that uh, you haven't seen complex PTSD until you've seen it in a veteran who has faced com combat and has been betrayed by his or her own team with military sexual trauma, predator, prey, and witness, and incest within the unit. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's another reason. I will tell you, as a veteran myself, I know we all get these calls on a regular basis. Just on the way to this meeting today, I got another call, this time from a cousin of a sergeant who killed himself and his partner at Fort Bragg just last week. Treatment as usual is not the answer. Rick, you mentioned Dr. Rachel Yehuda, who is a wonderful, world-renowned PTSD researcher right here in New York City. Friday, last Friday, December, September 15th, she had agreed to come graciously and testify at the New York City City Council hearing on PTSD the day before the Veterans Administration Center for PTSD, the National Center, denied her request. The world will know what veterans experience and we will forever be indebted to you, Rick, which is why I am going to give you the last word here. We have a minute <laughs> less. So take us home, Rick Doblin. Rick, real okay. quick, one word though yeah, on this right. before you take the last yeah. word is on Wednesday, we have an entirely female veteran panel specifically for this. So Beautiful. where there's an extra layer of complexity with the trauma, 
and uh, most of them in the audience, and they're going to have their voices heard. Yeah. Well, roughly uh, over 50% of the protocols that are being submitted to the Division of Psychiatry at FDA are about psychedelics. So the innovation in mental health is coming in large part from psychedelic assisted therapies. We're not saying the psychedelics work in and of themselves. They work as adjuncts to psychotherapy. The essence of the therapeutic method, and this is why it's different than treatment as usual, is that it's not about controlling the symptoms. It's not about giving somebody a pill to take every day for the rest of their lives. It's about going into a deep dive into the causes of the trauma, helping people express it, and then to be able to integrate it. So there's a lot of therapy before the psychedelic sessions to prepare them for it, a lot of therapy afterwards to integrate it. And there's a scientist, Gould Dolan, at Johns Hopkins that's talked about how the brain has critical periods for different kind of learning. We all know kids learn languages easier than adults can. And so psychedelics open up these critical periods so that there are periods of weeks, sometimes even longer, after the psychedelic experience where your brain is more plastic. You can reroute how you process certain memories. And that's how it can be done that with some few deep sessions, you can make lifelong permanent changes. And it's a way in which we can try to empower the person. It's where you get treatment as usual. It's being done to you. And the essence of psychedelic therapy is that people are their own healers. We have this theoretical model about this inner healer. We all know that our body uh, heals itself below our level of conscious awareness. And there's a similar theory about this inner healing intelligence of the psyche. And when you give someone a psychedelic, what emerges in our therapeutic approach is according to some inner logic. It's not that the therapist is prescribing it. It's that people will come up with whatever, sometimes sensations in the body, sometimes distant memories, sometimes they just have emotions. And we support them to experience whatever it is, and that's what leads to the healing. Well, and I lied. I said I was going to give you the last <laughs> word. But let you, you made me think of something, and I think okay. it's important to end with this. At the MAPS conference in Denver earlier wow. this summer, there was a speaker who said, how do you go from a moment to an actual movement? Good ideas aren't enough. Resources yeah. aren't enough. Laws aren't enough. You need to train the next generation. And as I look at us here today, you and me, you know, we're <laughs> the old guys. We need backup. That's why we got you, Isaac, and you, Brett, and folks here, and everyone who's drawn to this session. And then we've got the Amelias in Ukraine. Wow, yeah. Who are committed to making healing of suffering a movement, not just a moment. And yes, the world will know. Thank you so much, you all. Thank you very much for being here.